before I start, I want to just give you a little bit of background who I am, right? You, you understand I'm a mechanical engineer, but I want to I I kind of add some color to why I ended up at IBA, right? Why is a mechanical engineer at IBA? I designed some of the buildings behind us here as a mechanical engineer, right? I was a mechanical engineer, a project manager for plumbing and electrical, um, <clears throat> a lead consultant, and an energy modeler. And I said to myself, when I would go into these rooms and these meetings, and I would try to minimize energy usage, what am I accomplishing in reality? What do you need to do to minimize energy usage in a building, right? Ultimately, the end result is reducing the size of the mechanical systems, right? Does that make sense? So now, take that message back to your boss and tell him, I just reduced the size of our mechanical systems. And I reduced the size of the ductwork and the size of the pipes or eliminated stuff. What do you think he told me? <laughs> well, you reduced the size of our fee. So there, there is a, a, that, that is a microchasm of, of what I believe is an industry-wide issue. And that is that we have to push the efficiency from the mechanical systems towards the building envelope. But in order to do that, we have to get beyond this kind of um, paradigm with how we approach the design process. And I think Israel is smiling here because he, he understands that concept very well. And he was trying to steal a little bit of my thunder um, in the introduction. Um, and, and I hope to maybe reinforce this a little bit further. Right? So I start out with this, this slide because I love the quote. Um, and I think it's very timely. <laughs> what is the use of a house if you haven't got a tolerable planet to live on? Right? And then I add to it by saying, what is the use of a building if it's not a desirable place to work in? Right? We're facing increased issues with regulatory requirements. We're, we're facing issues with people trying to drive down the percentage of glass. And, and Gary alluded to it, Israel alluded to it, Dr. Hoistler alluded to it. We have to respect the people and the market demands for what they like and what they accept, right? We can't nod to regulatory requirements continuing to push down percentage of glass because in reality, that's a single component of the building and the building is an organism. The building is a, a whole uh, uh, mesh of different systems that are intended to work together Rarely do they work together, and I can say that because I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, so we can't try and pinpoint one particular component and drive it down because we believe glass is bad, right? Or glass is less insulative, so therefore glass uses ultimately less, uh, more energy within a building. Um, so some of the paths I've diagrammed out here, and, and the, the real point is, the Energy Code recognizes that there is this kind of whole building approach, right? So that 40% glass number, which is kind of the, the, the magic number in Energy Code compliance, that's part of the prescriptive code compliance path, right? That's the path that's on the left there. And then within that, you can go into, I'm sorry, that's the path which is on the right. It's hard for me to see it all the way back there. Um, and so then within that, you can drop down into comp check or you can do a tabular analysis, but you can basically treat each component as a, a each, each trade as a component and make sure each trade as a component is meeting the energy code. And you're left with a building which is 40% glass and mechanical systems were meet, which are meeting the energy code and lighting systems were uh, a certain watts per square foot. And it's a pretty plain Jane vanilla building. And there are a lot of buildings out there that use that approach and it's appropriate to use that approach. But there's other buildings out there, and most of which are the high performance type, that go down the performance path for energy code compliance. And that performance path allows you two different options. You can easily, either use the New York City energy code or you can use the ASHRAE code. And this is the same all throughout the country. I'm, I'm focusing on New York City because this is what we know, what, know best. 
But within that, it gets even more complicated because of all the rules and regulations outlined within that code. You can't actually use that model that you've used to generate to show that, that you're code compliant. You can't use that model effectively to then predict energy usage. So then you have to create another model, which becomes another issue and even more complicated, right? So there's a lot of things that are going on right now that, that we have to deal with that kind of force us to maybe focus a little bit more on that prescriptive approach. Um, and I'm going to show you why we're missing a lot of value when we acknowledge that 40 percent threshold um, and, and essentially on occasion design right to it um, without maybe moving past that opportun the opportunities to get to that high performance level. So I read a book. I'm, I'm just going to show you a couple of concepts here which helped to mold my vision for where I wanted to go and where I believe the industry needs to go. Right? There's this concept of the tyranny of the ore. I read a book by Jim Collins called Built to Last. It's an excellent book and I highly recommend you read it. It's actually not about buildings, it's about businesses. But it talks about the concept that you can achieve both, right? There is this mindset that you can have one or the other. I can, I can be a long-term growth potential or I can receive immediate gain, right? That's what he talked about in the, in the book. Or I can have high performance or I can be energy efficient. Which would you rather drive, right? I, I know which I'd rather drive. I actually have something a little bit in between. I have a, a 1965 Mustang that I restored, which probably gets about 11 miles to the gallon. It doesn't go anywhere near as fast as a Ferrari. Um, but I, I certainly enjoy the high performance much more. But I'm a, a self-professed tree hugger. I used to have long hair. So, so I acknowledge the idea that you know, we need to be energy efficient. The, the concept, though, that Jim Collins talks about is we can have both, right? And, and um, Gary used the, the Tesla, and it's funny, I literally changed this slide from the Tesla to this car for this particular presentation. We, we, I mean, it, it's, it's funny, but it's a common thread among all of these presentations. And I think that's impressive because you've got a manufacturer, fabricator, you've got an architect, and you've got an engineer in an envelope company, and we're all saying about the same thing, right? You can achieve high performance and energy efficiency. The difference in buildings is that we don't need the carbon fiber technology or the lithium ion batteries or the complex controls, although we have to get there. But we have the ability to do this now. We have the ability to do this without that complex, expensive machinery and materials. And we have the ability to do this through integrative design, through using the principles of integrative design to trade off between mechanical systems and building envelope components to create a better whole as opposed to optimizing components. Do you understand that concept? I see a lot of nodding heads, so maybe I'm preaching to the choir. I hope I'm preaching to the choir. There's another concept that kind of molded my kind of thinking or dream or, or vision, and that's the idea of conservation versus efficiency. Who knows the difference? It's, it's, it's kind of evident in the, in the pictures here. I'm hoping this picture gets burned into your brain. Conservation is essentially telling people to do less with less. Whereas efficiency is saying to somebody, you can still live the way you've expected to live, but we're going to do it more efficiently. So the fundamental difference there is that there is a behavioral modification which is required to promote conservation. We're telling people to do it differently in, conser in conservative strategies. That was the push in the 70s. And I believe that that push to tell people to turn the lights off, tell people to turn the thermostat down and wear a sweater was the reason, amongst many others, primarily oil going back down to $10 a barrel. But that was the reason that we didn't have extended um, kind of or sustainable adoption uh, of energy efficiency. So at this point, we've acknowledged that. Right? 
We're telling people that you don't have to take the stairs. We're going to build a better elevator. We're going to put a regenerative drive into the elevator machine room that regenerates energy as the potential energy of the elevator car as it's coming down is released. That's a way of being more energy efficient as opposed to telling people, you know, take the stairs instead of the elevator. The same thing is true of glass in buildings. You recognize this profile, right? You just look through the window behind me. This is Seven World Trade Center. What do you think this is? Is that telling somebody to be conservative? Or is that an efficiency approach? Are we telling people to do less with less or to experience the same thing but be more energy efficient? It's obvious, right? And we have to recognize that there is a market demand for this and that we have to address how to accomplish this as efficiently and effectively as possible so that we can meet that diverging market demand or perceived diverging market demand for energy efficiency and glass buildings. And we can do it. And Gary alluded to it earlier with some of his charts. And I'm going to show you in, in my personal analysis, along with Viridian, of a specific building, which is one of the ones behind me. Unfortunately, I can't tell you which one, um, where we performed an analysis and show that you can achieve lower levels of energy usage in higher percentage glass buildings. And additionally, you know, buildings are all about people. We build buildings for a lot of reasons, right? The common thread is always people. We have to acknowledge that. It's just that, like the conservation versus efficiency strategy. Would you rather be in an opaque office building or would you rather be in that beautiful glass building to the right? This is actually a slide that I stole from our fellows at Cushman Wakefield, one of our co-presenters up in, at the USGBC presentation. So I have to give them credit for this. But this is what they acknowledge, and this is what their tenants are coming to them and saying. And this is why there is such a need for or a demand for glass in buildings. And this is why we have to understand how to design them efficiently so that we can redirect those diverging demands for energy efficiency in glass buildings. So I love this quote because I, can, I think it kind of sums up this epitome that I had and what I believe is this um, kind of paradigm shift that needs to occur in the indus industry. We cannot continue to use the same thinking in order to solve the problems that got us into this mess in the first place. Right? We have to think about things differently. So how do we do that? Right? And we've all heard from these uh, excellent presenters already about the integrative design process, so I'm not going to harp on that. Um, but there's a very interesting quote from Amory Lovins, another uh, friend of mine that I've uh, interacted with out at Rocky Mountain Institute. Optimizing components in isolation tends to pessimize the whole system. So what do I mean by that? Put all of the money into a super efficient chiller, and for you know exaggeration sake, say, throw that chiller into uh, you know, a, a barn that has um, wind, uh, walls made of Swiss cheese, right? You've optimized the component, but you haven't looked at the building as a whole and optimized that system. You've, you've pessimized that system. That chiller's going to run at full bore all day long to try and keep that leaky barn cool, right? So you have to look at how your decisions economically affect the whole system and go beyond that and understand how taking something from one trade and applying it to another can end up in a benefit to the whole as opposed to a zero-sum game, which is one of the things I kind of uh, uh, mentioned there at the bottom. So force team members to weigh in on things that they're not used to weighing in, right? Make the mechanical engineer tell you exactly why he's designed the system the way he's designed it, right? Ring out of him those 30-year-old safety factors. I, the, the best example of this is plumbing engineers. And I hate to pick on plumbing engineers because I'm not a plumbing engineer. But they continue to size water heaters based on fixture units which were developed in the 60s. 
fixture units as a measure of calculation of water usage. We have EPA standards that require much, much lower fixture flow rates than what were designed originally in the 60s. But they continue to use those numbers because that's what their bosses told them to use. Another example, energy recovery units. Air handling units have energy recovery units. They're big wheels that spin in an air handling unit. The idea there is you can reduce load by transferring air for heat from one side of the unit to the other. The very, it's, it's, it's actually quite complicated and I won't go into that. But the idea is you can reduce the system size by transferring heat from one side of the airstream to the other. I was put in a situation where I'm designing a system and my boss says to me, I'm not downsizing that air handling unit. And I say, but the capacity that I'm calculating is, is you know, two-thirds of what you're telling me I need to put this unit in as. And there's cost associated with that. And then I go so far as to say, look, engineer, boss, it says in the energy code that we, ca we have to take it, uh, that, the credit for that energy recovery wheel. And he still says, uh-uh, I'm not doing it. So there are these paradigms, right? There, there are these ingrained kind of thought processes which have developed over time based on old technology. Gary in alluded to it now. We've gotten, you know, 400 percent in the right direction in building envelopes on glass units. We've done similar things with mechanical systems, right? We've done uh, incredible things with lighting systems. The incandescent bulb. Now we've, we've been able to get from 100 watts down to an equivalent of 9 watts for LED. Think about that percentage improvement, right? So I want to couch my analysis with why I decided to do the analysis. And another commonality is the lever house here, uh, iconic glass building curtain wall. So why do glass buildings have this moniker of being energy hogs? Well, you look at where we came from, and I don't want to detract from the aesthetic of this building and the, and the importance of this building in any way. I'm just using it because people understand where it is and what it is. But we changed in the 50s from this kind of H-style mass building with operable windows everywhere, no air conditioning or rarely any air conditioning because they relied on operable windows, right? It got very hot out. They opened the windows. They had an exhaust fan which, which would draw air through the building and exhaust it out the top. And that was their form of air conditioning. So then we moved to glass buildings. And one of the things that was left out of these early glass buildings in mass, I'm not saying that it was left out entirely, but but for a good portion, is that operable window. It disappeared for all intents and purposes in commercial buildings. So now we can't naturally ventilate these buildings, so we have to air condition them. So now we're presented with a problem because we've got to air condition these buildings and mechanical engineers are coming back and saying, man, that's a lot of load that I've got to overcome. So what do we do? We tint the windows. Right? We're trying to maximize a component in isolation. So what's the unintended consequence there? We use more lights. We turn them on more often. So now these glass buildings, which are single pane, there's, there's minimal uh, you know, attention to detail with, with framing. And Gary mentioned all of this stuff already, so I won't go into that detail. And we've got additional electric lighting loads at this point, and we're no longer naturally ventilating. So there's all of these things that are happening that are now giving glass buildings a bad name. And it's all because we tried to maximize components in isolation, not understanding how that impacts the whole. So then we move to technologies today. And again, I'm not going uh, to kind of harp on this because you've seen a lot of this already, but I love this example. Unfortunately, it's not one we worked on. <laughs> I would love to have given one that we worked on, but this one is particularly interesting to me because it's very simple. All they did to reduce solar gain was tilt the glass 15 percent. What does that do for you? It reduces that angle of incidence that is entering into the glass. So you're reducing solar heat gain into the building, but you're still allowing just as much natural light. And then they included high, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
very good technology for the framing and the glass, and they utilized that return for PV on the south and west sides of the facade. Right? So this is where we're at now. This, amongst many of other, the other points that our other presenters have made, allows us to think about glass buildings in a different framework, right? So enough with the concepts. I have, I think, one more concept buried within my study. Um, so I wanted to prove out, you know, what's really happening here. I've read a lot of studies, I've seen a lot of charts, but I wanted to do it for myself. I wanted to understand it. And I have the power of some of the best modelers in the Northeast, some would say even in the, in the country, behind me. So let's take a building that we've modeled that's been proven out by LEED and by our modelers. It's accurate. It's in existence. We understand how it's operating. We understand that the model is operating to predict that energy usage. And yet, let's use that as our baseline. And better yet, let's move that around the country so we see how it, how it works in different areas of the country. And then let's vary a couple of other things to see you know, really what's happening and what can we achieve. The other thing to mention here is we didn't change the programming. We didn't change the, light, the daylighting capabilities other than adding electric daylight dimming systems, which I'll get into, but we didn't add daylight shelves. So we weren't counting on 20 feet into the building or 30 feet into the building, which is what you can eventually get to, just as Gary had mentioned. We're looking at it from a kind of a standardized approach because we realize that this is something that has to be mass adopted, right? We're, I don't want to appeal to the minority here. I want to appeal to the, to the majority. So we took code compliant base building mechanical systems and we took high performance glass, a light to solar gain ratio of about 1.85, similar to like a, a solar band 70 XL, which is what you see is kind of the norm. And we used that to formulate our base building. So why did we do this? And, and, and Gary hit on this again a little bit earlier. There is this misconception that the building envelope is a large contributor to overall energy usage. And that may be true or, or, or more true or more of a, of a contributor in residential buildings, but in commercial office buildings, it's not necessarily the case. And it's apparent just by going onto EIA's website and downloading the latest CBEX data. And you can see energy usage, okay, space heating and space cooling are a pretty big chunk. But when you change over to energy cost and you look at how much it costs to heat and cool because energy to heat is much cheaper, approximately three times cheaper than, than electricity. Fossil fuel gas is three times cheaper per BTU than electricity. That number for heating drops. Well, the, the major argument for mass versus glass is thermal performance, right? Heat transfer, conduction, and, um, I'm sorry, conduction, essentially. Now we've shrunk in that piece of the pie or piece of the bar chart substantially, and it gets better. Let's evaluate that a little bit further. And without getting into the numbers, because I, I don't want to bore you, it's late, I'm the last person, so the last thing I want to do is, is, is put you to sleep. You take out of that the theoretical minimum of space heating and cooling required to heat and cool outside air, which is a code requirement, and now you're left with about 17% of the overall building energy use, which is directly attributable to heat loss and heat gain through the building envelope. 17% of heating and cooling is directly attributable to heat loss and heat gain through the building envelope. Commercial building is, this, this is the commercial building case. Residential is much different, so I have to caution you on that. You, again, you can't take one approach and put it in a different location. It's, you, you have to understand this on a unique building by building basis. So this is the other kind of concept that I wanted to explain. And this is a, a little bit harder to understand, I think, but I, I picked a, an analogy because I think it makes a good point. Right, you walk out of Starbucks and you have a hot cup of coffee and it's the middle of winter. Which would you prefer? Obvious, right? You want the thermos. You want to keep that coffee hot. Now let's say that that coffee has an internal heat generation source and that coffee isn't coffee but it's a building. It's the internal loads within the building and those internal loads within the building are constantly operating and constantly rejecting heat. 
So you didn't just pour the coffee and walk away. You poured the coffee, and there's a little heater in there that's continuing to run. And then the coffee's too hot, and it's the middle of summer. Which would you prefer to have the coffee in, the thermos or the cup? I want my coffee to cool off so I can drink it. So I may even add ice to the coffee cup. What is that ice? It's air conditioning, right? That's the concept here. <laughs> Insulation is very critical in a building envelope at peak heating conditions, and even for us, uh, the heating season generally. But you have to understand that buildings exist throughout the whole season, right? And the rest of the temperate months and the summer months may not actually benefit you much by adding insulation. And in fact, they don't in some cases. And the only way I can prove this to you is to sit you down in front of my computer and show you the energy modeling and show you the results. Or you can go out and do some research and kind of figure it out on your own. So again, I think I had on here, but I already harped on it. Residential is a different story, right? So you got to take that with a grain of salt. Another concept which we've hit on a lot, but which is interesting to kind of put numbers to, is that daylighting is actually more energy efficient than the best LED lights out there. I don't have LED on here. I don't think, oh yeah, I did, I added it. Fluorescent and LED are about at that lumens per watt, right? Sky, ambient sky conditions, provide more lumens or light per watt of energy than LEDs. So daylighting, in effect, can offset much more of that energy usage associated with lighting than an LED could. And we're climbing this kind of green slope, right, which we've hit on a lot. And I need to kind of brush through this to get, get on to the uh, analysis. So here's the case study. We used regional utility rates. We used the same geometry. We used the same schedules, operating schedules, control schedules, same HVAC systems, same lighting watts per square foot, and the same air change per hour infiltration rates. And then we varied three things. We looked at three, the three different climates, and we looked at four different percentage glass. And then we also looked at adding continuous daylight dimming and not having continuous daylight dimming, right? You understand what continuous daylight dimming is? You actually electronically dim the lights in response to a light sensor, which is measuring ambient lighting levels. So here's the three climates. I mentioned them already, Toronto, New York, Houston. Here's the four percentages of glass. There's one important distinction here. When we went to 75%, we took out the most ineffective portion of the wall for daylighting, right? So I'm, I'm kind of cheating there a little bit um, because I, I knew that that's an ineffective portion of the wall for daylighting. Um, and then you get the analysis. This is using New York City rates. And I, the only reason I show you New York City rates in Houston or, or Toronto is because of the impact of demand cost. The demand charge in New York City is so astronomical that you get a very steep slope. Do you understand how this chart works here? On the left is 100% glass, so obviously that's going to use the most energy. Middle is 75%, over to the right is, 25%, uh, is uh, 50%, and then 25%, and you've got the three different regions. So then you take out the demand charge associated with New York City rates, and you use those regional rates. And Gary alluded to this. Look at the flattening of the curve. Look at what's, ha what's happening there. There is really little impact associated with percent glass on commercial office space energy usage. Now this is the beautiful part. Add daylight dimming, and you start to see an inflection point. There's actually an optimal point at which percentage glass provides more daylight, daylight availability than heat, heat loss out of the building envelope because of all the concepts that I've talked about. So let's blow that up a little bit. And you can see 40% is not the optimal point when you include daylight dimming systems in your building. Right? Think about that. We can get better buildings at higher percentage glass using the technology available today with more, with more glass. Right? And, I, and, I, and, I, and I kind of will continue, we'll come back to that. So now I turn this argument on its head. And I say, what happens? You know, I, I want to prove out both situations. What happens if I take a 25% glass building and I double the insulation in the wall? 
What do you think happens? So here's the code compliant building, code compliant insulation, no daylight dimming. I double the percentage of insulation in the wall. There is a minimal increase in energy efficiency in a commercial office building, 25% glass, doubling the insulation value of the wall. So then, I like that, right? And I say, okay, let's look at the opportunities available to us in all glass buildings. So remember, this first analysis was just adding daylight dimming. Well, what about active, dim active shading or fixed shading, right? So then I looked at the 75% glass building, and I looked at what would happen if we added fixed shading. So all I did was change the solar heat gain coefficient to a, a lower level to mirror fixed shading devices in the model. So here's 75% daylight without, 75% glass without daylight dimming. Here is the addition of the daylight dimming. And you'll have to forgive me, I can't read the percentages there. But then here's what happens when we add fixed shading. So above and beyond the daylight dimming savings, we added fixed shading, you get an additional savings. Here's what happens when we add active shading. Because now we're letting the light and the heat in when we want it in early March and April, and we, we want the heat in, right, because we benefit that from that, and we're keeping it out in August, or late August and September, when we, we may not want it. Probably most importantly here is this kind of nascent issue or uh, identification. Look at Toronto fixed shading devices. Look at the impact of keeping that heat out in a cold climate when you want it because you've sized those fixed shading devices to keep the heat out in late August and September. You almost completely negate the benefit of fixed shading devices. But then you go to active shading devices and that benefit skyrockets because you let the heat in in a cold climate and you keep it out when you don't want it there. So here's the big picture. You can get up to an 11% savings using daylight dimming and active glass. But perhaps more importantly, look at the comparison to what is possible with 25% glass and doubling the insulation value of the opaque assembly. You've got a better opportunity in the higher percentage glass building to reduce energy usage than you do if you have an insulated opaque building. A better opportunity to make that building more energy efficient simply by choosing integrative solutions and working with other systems within the building. So what does this mean to you? I think you don't have to feel guilty about glass, right? And I see you laughing. I like that title, by the way. I think that should have been the title for the whole thing. It's, it's excellent. I think my, my title for the, the uh, US GB, GBC presentation was transparency in, this, in this, transparency in this Support of Sustainability, which is actually something that Israel came up with. But it's similar, right? We have to, we have to look at things differently. And, you, and when you do so, you can feel comfortable about how we're approaching these buildings. Right? You can achieve these high, performance these high performance buildings with glass, right? We don't have to change our desired aesthetic, right? Can you imagine telling Meets Van der Rohe if he could only use 40% glass? Could you imagine? I mean, I'm sure he would still design a beautiful building, but can you imagine putting those kinds of handcuffs on people? And can, can you imagine putting those handcuffs on us and then finding out that PVs have solved all of our problems? Or fuel cells have become so inexpensive that we don't have to worry about, you know, making the buildings themselves more energy efficient. And now we're stuck with 10 years worth of 25% <laughs> opaque buildings, 25% glass buildings, right? So, so think about those things when you're considering how you approach the design process. The solution is building specific. We talked about one example, commercial office building with fairly high internal loads, which is fairly similar, fairly uh, consistent with what we see in uh, high-rise commercial office space. And focus on those whole building impacts, right? And I, I've said this enough, so I'm not going to kind of continue. And approach the energy, system energy systematically and not relatively, right? Look at the whole system. And promote integrity in analysis. Don't just rely on somebody else's report. 
do it yourself or pay somebody to do it specific to how you want it to be done, right? Don't just pick up a book who might, which might be influenced by some other you know, lobbyist somewhere and say, well, that's what it says that I got to do, so that's what I'm going to do. You have to understand, you have to rely on facts and figures and, and, and analysis that is specific to your problem. And the, 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 the wild card here is the, the tenant versus the shell, right? Everything I've talked about today has been focused on integrating the inside of the building with the outside of the building. Well, what do we do in the city, and what do we do in a lot of commercial office space? We build the outside of the building without even knowing what's going to go in the inside of the building. It's a white box, right? So that's an issue. And that's an issue that we have to explain to the owners of these buildings right up front. You know, your glass building can be very efficient and very effective, but you have to make that message clear to the designers and architects of the fit out that they have to integrate with the building envelope in order to do that. So I think that's it, and I think we have a lot of food, and uh, I, I hope there's some beer here too. All right, I see her shaking her head. So I'm very excited to be here. I hope you enjoyed the presentations, and thank you very much to Shuko.